Okay, so we're all high on caffeine, especially on the attic, right? <laughs> okay, so we are back, and uh, I, it's my great honor now to uh, show you a pre-recorded uh, video from European Commissioner Nicholas Smith. And when he's done, I'm going to welcome uh, my colleague uh, Gerard Osterwijk from FEPS in Brussels to guide you through the next uh, topic. And uh, fittingly enough, that is uh, EU and what's happening on the EU level around these issues. But first, we start with the video uh, greetings from the Commissioner. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, thank you for inviting me to participate in this timely event. I'm particularly glad that you launched a digital research program on algorithmic management and workers' rights. This is a topic of great importance for the European Commission and for me personally. The technological change, globalization, Climate and demographic changes are reshaping our labor markets. Many people's working lives are being profoundly disrupted by technological innovation. More than 75% of companies worldwide are considering adopting AI-powered applications in the next five years. AI can no doubt increase productivity and diminish routine tasks done by humans. But if not carefully designed and monitored, it has the potential to have a negative effect on workers' well-being. For example, it can intensify work, increasing the workload and its pace. It can lead to continuous surveillance and excessive monitoring. It can cause discrimination and invasion of workers' privacy. <coughs> In a context of rapid technological change, we need to empower, not weaken, workers and their representatives. This is why the Commission included a chapter on algorithmic management in our proposed directive on improving working conditions in platform work. Precisely to ensure that there is transparency and human control over decisions that are made relying on algorithms. I'm confident that the directive will soon be agreed. Improving working conditions for millions of gig workers across Europe. And as President von der Leyen said recently, we are assessing whether further policy action is needed to promote healthy algorithmic management in every sector of the economy, not just platforms. The input of social partners will be key in the design and implementation of future policies. I count on your good ideas and collaboration and look forward to hearing about the outcomes of your conference. Thank you. Yes, hello. Um, thank you, Commissioner Smith, for a short, a short message. Uh, it was three minutes, it was uh, quite concise. Um, but I think also what he mentioned at the end, uh, they're working on certain proposals. And I think that's maybe also part of the reason why he had to be short, because there's things 
being developed at the moment and he cannot speak until they are uh, they are launched. Um, that being said, so I'm Gerard Oosterwijk. I'm a, a digital policy analyst at, uh, at the Foundation for European Progressive Studies. Um, we've been working with the Nordic partners on this digital program and also on organizing this uh, this event today. Um, and uh, it's my honor to moderate a, a debate, a panel debate uh, on, on more the, AU, uh, the EU dimension. So regulating platforms and AI, what does the EU do to stand up to big tech? Uh, because we heard also in the last, uh, the last panel that there is a lot of tools being developed that are maybe not developed in Europe, but rather in in, uh, in the US. So how do we how do we get this European dimension going? There's a lot of legislation going on, um, uh, has been passed or is being discussed at the moment. The AI Act uh, is one of them. It was mentioned by Commissioner Schmidt, the platform work directive with a with a chapter on algorithmic management. So I think there's enough to be uh, to be discussed. Um, I have the honor to introduce Teresa Ostbo Koldova from the uh, she's a research professor at the work uh, research institute at the oslo met university and also one of our researchers in the digital program so uh, she's going to do the norwegian case studies so one of our uh, one of us <laughs> teresa the floor is yours and after your introduction i will introduce the the panel thank you so much and uh, Vero, it is a great pleasure to be invited and offer remarks panel oh now it's still doing that We, we tried it. <laughs> I can stun it. <laughs> okay, so again, it is a great pleasure to be invited and offer opening remarks for this important panel on regulating platforms and AI. What does the EU do to stand up to big tech? So while our panelists will delve into several concrete issues pertaining to the proposed regulation and especially I think the AI Act, I will offer general remarks on what I see as some of the fundamental challenges in standing up to big tech and protecting fundamental rights at work, privacy, collective rights, equality, and human dignity. I want us to take a step back and reflect on the ways in which we are being governed today and the ways in which we seek to prevent and preempt harms and ensure protection of rights. From the level of EU directives via national legislation or collective agreements to the corporate style governance in both private and public sector. Looking closer at the nature of this governance and regulation, we realize that it is driven by the logic of technobureaucratic, formalistic and legalistic compliance, which is organized around the imperatives of risk-based management, auditing, impact assessments, due diligence, standards, streamlining of organizational and technical processes, transparency, disclosure, and so on. This governance logic itself is now being turned into a software product on the market by so-called Rectech or regulatory technology companies. Rectechs promise companies to automate their compliance with complex regulations, be it GDPR, anti-money laundering, countering of terrorism financing, supply chain due diligence, the whistleblowing directive, ESG reporting, and so on. And they will offer precisely such products for compliance with the AI Act in the future. These Rectech software products promise to prevent anything from fraud, insider trading, corruption, security breaches, to sexual harassment, bullying, and microaggressions through an even more detailed surveillance and monitoring of workers, suppliers, and clients alike. Much of this tech falls within the high-risk category. Regulatory compliance itself has thus become a massive market for auditing and consulting companies, such as the big four audit firms, as much as for big tech and startups funded by venture capital. The same tools used for the purpose of regulatory compliance are routinely leveraged to surveil workers, assess their performance, exert control and sanction. In the current geopolitical context, with the war in Ukraine and threats posed by authoritarian regimes such as China, the hate and concerns about national security drive the security industry ever closer to Rectech as security features become integrated into regulatory compliance solutions. This security is again imagined to be achieved through preemptive surveillance. It will be therefore even more difficult in the future to argue against security and for workers' rights as the security interests of the nation states will come into conflict with workers' rights and protections. We already see it in the discussions about predictive policing and border security. In this context of commodification and capture of regulatory compliance and standard setting by an alliance of tech and audit companies, the widely discussed propositions around the need for algorithmic auditing would translate into the auditing of compliance software and its algorithms. Effectively, risk and audit-based regulations such as the AI Act will open up new markets for tech and compliance businesses. 
products by so-called independent third parties will emerge on the market and provide solutions for algorithmic auditing in compliance with the AI Act. Ironically enough, therefore, Rectech products that themselves are compliant, compliance and audit with current regulations will be audited by both new and old actors within this market. Indeed, one begins to wonder about how workers' rights and dignity can be preserved vis-a-vis -vis this alliance of big tech and big audit. We can trace this form of meta-governance and the ballooning of compliance-driven solutions to the emergence of internal control regulation from the mid-70s onwards. The introduction of this principle meant, to put it simply, that control bodies such as labor inspectorates and other supervisory bodies would no longer inspect the realities on the ground, but instead largely control the control systems in place in organizations. When realities on the ground are no longer the primary focus of inspections, trust is instead placed in the formal design of compliance and control systems and in key intermediaries, auditors, lawyers, compliance officers, data, and other experts. The way in which organizations translate laws and regulations into practice is to a large degree left to their discretion, such as the choice of third-party multi-purpose software for both compliance and worker monitoring. This convergence of surveillance capitalism and regulatory capitalism poses a fundamental challenge. In many ways, it has contributed to the monopolization of definition power by the employer and corporate interests. This epistemic dimension is often neglected in the struggle to protect workers. But I think it is fundamental in a world where we not only trust, but even worship data, while we look down upon qualitative forms of knowledge. The employer has disproportionate power and discretion to translate legal and regulatory texts into practice and into software. We therefore see practices of so-called creative compliance, where the letter of the law is followed but its spirit is undermined and perverted. Laws intended to protect workers can even become weaponized against workers. The algorithmic architectures of control built in the name of compliance further reinforce this power of the employer. Trade unions often find themselves in a battle against this epistemic power of the employers. They produce their own interpretations, reports, numbers and expert knowledge to counterbalance the discursive power of professionals acting in the interest of capital. This is often difficult. What we are left with is a battle of intermediaries and experts. Upon my view, this technocratic and depoliticized battle not only glosses over the fundamental power imbalances, but disavows and distracts from realities and harms on the ground. So those of us trying to protect the basic dignity and rights of workers are too implicated in the reproduction of this form of governance. In our desire to control the forces of capital and their exploitative drives, and in our desire to protect the worker, we often call for more of the same type of regulation, expecting different results. We, of course, wish to hold the powerful accountable. We want transparency, and so we call for risk assessments, audits, impact assessments, investigations, for human in the loop in algorithmic decision making. We call for more data and more disclosures. But I think that we are reaching a point where we need to ask, can more of the same regulatory logic, which is now commodified, really deliver justice and dignity for workers? Who will define and translate this compliance into practice? Who will be this human in the loop? Will it be the local HR department or a trade union or a data engineer? You know, a human in the loop, Putin is also a human. It can be Putin in the loop, I don't know. Do we want that? <laughs> Who is this human? I always ask. Can we expect workers to really understand the exhausting complexity of regulations and of algorithms? Who among us here in the room can truly assess the validity of an algorithmic audit or a human rights impact assessment? Who defines what is ethical? and what is an acceptable risk. All this is discretionary power left to the employers. Are audits even a real solution to the inequalities, injustices, and harms that we seek to tackle? Can AI be reasonably regulated uh, as a mere product on the market as the AI Act wants to do? When it is in fact reshaping the ways in which we are managed, governed, and policed by comp corporations, employers, and even states. How can we then ensure the collective rights, protections, and justice? How can we ensure that they are a reality and not a mere data-driven compliance fiction? What I like to call compliance washing that we see abundantly. In my view, this will require us to ask hard questions about the limits and pitfalls of risk-based regulation. It will also require us to return to fundamental questions of power and politics, to co-determination and rights-based regulation. The Rectech 
uh, landscape, the regulatory technologies is populated by products protecting the employer from the liability while expanding workplace surveillance. But there is, as far as I can see, no market for software to protect workers and ensure their rights vis-a-vis -vis the employer. Instead, we see a function creep and a perversion of compliance into managerial tools for managing workers. There is no software to alert the employer about his breach of collective agreement and co-determination rules, but there is a multitude of algorithmic solutions to alert the employer about exceeding the time limit for a toilet break or using negative wording in an email. The AI Act promises that such high-risk tech solutions will come under closer scrutiny, but who will be the auditors and in whose interest will they act? My deep worry is that this layering of auditing and self-disclosure is glossing over and disavowing the harms on the ground, allowing them to continue, if not proliferate. The human experience, the human cost, and the human as such become buried ever deeper in the regulatory and technological maze of control architectures, which also make it even more difficult to voice critique and dissent. And dissent is actively being preempted by lots of these platforms. <laughs> How can we, within this governance landscape, which I argue may be part of the problem, fight for the rights and protections of workers and for real compliance with labor laws, with collective agreements, and for real and meaningful co-determination and for the workers' power. How can we ensure not only decent work, but human flourishing, which I think is even more important for the many? Thank you, and this is my question to all of you. <laughs> Thank you, Teresa. It's a, a very provocative uh, uh, speech, and I think it gives a lot of food for thought, I think, as well for, for our program, but also for the discussion that will, uh, will follow. Um, I would like to invite the panel to the, to the stage. I know we have quite a lot of people, so we have to see a little bit how we share. So I will share my mic as well, so that you know, like you can also stand a bit here towards me. Uh, we have uh, Samuel Engblom, a former Swedish state secretary responsible for higher education, research, and space policy. Uh, also with a history in the trade union, so uh, yeah, so with a bit of a double uh, double background, we have from the European Parliament Mia Petra Kompula Natri. Um, she was rapporteur on a European strategy for data, uh, but more more legislation also amongst them roaming. Yeah? So uh, it's from the last term, but uh, always active in the in the more digital uh, digital files. Uh, we have Linda Larsson from LO. Hello, Sweden, a researcher at Hello. Uh, we have from Paris, we have uh, Anna Milanes from the OECD, giving more an international perspective, broader than just Europe. And last but not least, uh, Johanna Wenkebach, director of the Hugo Sinsheimer Institute for Labor. I think so. Maybe we can. So. Let me start. Samuel, you you can be the first one, maybe to 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 react. What? Yeah. So you you talk first, and then we can. <laughs> but if you react, like, how did you feel about this uh, this first provocative thought? <laughs> No, I mean, I think for me, these are issues that I have looked at as a, as a labor lawyer, but also as someone who's, who's interested in regulatory policy. For, for many years, actually, I was a member of the, the Swedish Better Regulation Council, uh, you know, which is part of sort of this better regulation agenda that we also have on the EU level. And, and I think my argument uh, is that uh, when uh, confronted with the, the challenges brought by new uh, new technologies, I think that the first instinct of the regulator uh, should always be to apply existing legislation, uh, regardless of how novel the sort of the inventors or the the, the marketers of this technology claims that it is. Uh, and if we look, look at labor law, I mean the purpose of labor law is to regulate the relationship between uh, uh, employers and their workers. And the reason that uh, labor law regulates this is because there is an unbalance of power uh, between the two. Uh, and um and this uh, really is not affected by whether the employer uses a certain technology or not. Uh, and I think it's important to always remind ourselves that your boss is never an algorithm. It, you, it is your boss using an algorithm, right? Uh, and 
the introduction of, of, of new regulation, if you choose that path, there, I think there is always a risk uh, for regulatory capture uh, that with special regulation, uh, um, companies uh, that apply a certain technology uh, can get their own set of rules uh, and thereby uh, um, sort of getting a, a competitive advantage to other companies. And we can see how, yeah, the ride hauling companies claim that they're not taxi companies to get a competitive advantage is the best example. Um, and my concern regarding the AI Act is that it might actually supplant some existing regulation if we're not, not careful. Uh, this is not to say that, that uh, new technologies do not change the labor market, because they do. And we heard from uh, Jenny Wrangboy, for example, uh, uh, examples of, of, of how this is done. So even though legal, there, legally there is no difference between sort of the boss uh, giving you orders and the boss uh, using an algorithm to, to, to give you orders, uh, in, in practice, there is a difference, and I think, therefore, uh, there is a need to regulate digital tools uh, uh, the same way uh, uh, um, that we have regulated the dangerous machinery and, and, and toxic substances. And just moving to then what should be the EU regulatory agenda, I think uh, we can see how the EU uh, in the digital field has really come to play an important role. I mean, the fact that everyone has to click, uh, all over the world has to click away these cookies thing, uh, that's an expression of our imperial power, right? <laughs> uh, and, and, and our common imperial power. Uh, and, and, and I think also uh, product regulation is an area where the EU has a mandate and a clear role because we have a common market. Uh, protection, of funda protection of fundamental rights is also something that is better done on a supranational level, on a national level. Uh, we have privacy, we have GDPR. Uh, the more difficult areas, I think, are when we move into things that are also regulated on the national level and where there are big, uh, big institutional differences. So we talk about co-determination. We've discussed a lot today. Uh, we talk about occupational safety and health. And I think if we're going to uh, if you look at the, if you look at the platform work directive, for example, I mean, can I understand the political background and I, there are benefits with that directive. At the same time, as a regulatory tool, I think this of regula regulating a, a specific use, uh, a specific part of the labor market, uh, might not be the best case. So I hope. I mean, dear to talked earlier about this. Okay, what is the next thing? Should we have a bigger legislative package uh, regarding uh, digital di sort of uh, algorithms in the labor market and, and, and sort of digital management of labor markets? Uh, and I think if that is the case. I think that should probably focus on. Um, uh, I mean, first you have to do it in a way that takes into account the fact that there are big institutional differences uh, uh, between the, the, the member states, and I think that we should you should focus on product product regulation, uh, uh, but then also on the uh, uh, and that, that's probably where the, where the big uh, trend. And then uh, uh, also on uh, how we can make. Uh, existing, as I said, the existing uh, sort of there might be some loopholes that have to be sort of uh, loopholes that, that 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 I think uh, if you if look at the uh, platform work directive, for example, it's full of uh, you know you say but this every, each and every article starts with without prejudice to X, Y, and Z. I think really uh, if we're going to make a new uh, regulation, uh, sort of a bigger problem, I think. Uh, it could, there could be an, er, an issue for actually sort of making special provisions for the labor market. Like we have, when I mean, we discussed the GDPR, the fact that there is an opening for labor market regulation. This is something that we asked for uh, on, the, on the national level to have a GDPR for the labor market. I think that's the kind of project where we clearly sort of exempt the labor market make, make it from uh, uh, rules that are applied in other areas, that we make this clearly this difference that... Uh, uh, regulation that is mainly actually about consumer protection mm. uh, is not the best way of regulating the labor market. Very interesting, and I think also uh, something for Mia Petra Kapulanatri to to react because there is still a file ongoing on the AI uh, Liability Act. I think it's called or directive. I think I'm, I'm, I'm a bit with all the acts. It's sometimes difficult to keep track. We have the AI Act in 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 uh, trialogue. The platform work directive. It's not finalized. It's still in trialogue. Both of them might. Yeah, we hope that they will get get finalized before the European elections. So there's a lot of things ongoing. You heard also that Commissioner Schmidt kind of like it's announced that something is coming. How, how do you see see this? And what do you think is an approach? Or what what are in your discussions that you have uh, in the in the, the European legislation process. Uh, what are the discussions that, that are relevant for our discussion today? 
Thank you for inviting and very happy to join you. I was online all the time and I took my flight from Helsinki during your lunch, so I didn't miss much. Uh, so very happy to be here and that everything is linked. First of all, I'm very happy to have the trade on the agenda now. When I started it five years ago in, or in the beginning of this term on data strategy, I took contact to Etuk and I took contact to quite several places and they were concentrating there will be platform workers directive. This is where we're going to concent uh, concentrate, mm. most of the trade unions. And I say, are you, anybody keen on data? Data? Mm. Because data is the AI, data is the platforms, data is the, uh, the everything. But then um, data is not that sexy, it's much more sexy than AI or platforms or workers or so. Mm. So uh, that was actually something also the Breton brought on board, uh, even he's a liberal, he had the knowledge and he's keen on the European economy. So uh, first of all I think we have to look what the AI is eating, what the algorithms are eating, and they are eating data. So who have right to access on the data? So that has been mentioned here several times, and that's why you are more concrete already now than maybe five or ten years ago. I had the challenges the previous term when I started nine years ago. This is my second mandate as a member of European Parliament that I, I was doing the report uh, together, IMCO, Internal Markets Consumer <laughs> side, and then ITRE, my committee on the technology innovations. Uh, science and uh, space and uh, energy too. Uh, so we are all the time talking about the DS uh, the data markets, digital single markets. Okay. And I would say when we try to, uh, when are we starting to talk about the data or digital single uh, society or one digital society? And now we are conflicting with a lot of values. And also, even uh, we are progressive, most of us here, I guess, it's still valid that we have a European uh, uh, understanding what we want to do different. And I think it's, again, when we head to the next uh, commission time, should we talk about the digital society more broadly? Democratic uh, decision making, how to, to have this fight against the uh, authoritarian models and so, and also uh, put it human in the center and then uh, human rights. Uh, so this links a lot then on the human rights, very concrete questions came often to my mind too. There is going to be, I hope, uh, from the parliament uh, negotiation mandate is this AI office to have the un fundamental rights checks on this product ma uh, management way of the AI Act. Are you lobbying already who will be there to represent the workers' right as a human right? Mm -hmm. Who is? Mm -hmm because that's what we try to do. So all that is very concrete that we also remember that when we talk about the human rights, it's not individual right only, because it's pretty hard to carry on that one, as we see it for the GDPR. So uh, on the data, I was more working this mandate after the data strategy was mentioned here. I was also working on the data act, which is now ready uh, and, and need to be implemented. And that also was the, the value that whatever equipment you use, when it's the smart equipment, it's not only the manufacturer of the equipment can collect the data and you might know to ride, negotiate to have the access on that data. I wonder how many Swedish tractor farm owners can negotiate with the Volvo tractor that I want to have this and that data, because there's no data if I don't drive it, if I don't use it. If I produce data, is it only for the manufacturer? So it's not easy to think on the Wärtsilä models from my home city Vasa or my previous home city. Uh, but then it's, it's all this value what we are now uh, looking at. So I, I was working a lot with the SMEs, the European SMEs, that also they can uh, be part of this economy. So uh, the, these different economical relations, I think the, most, the biggest achievement of this mandate was that we have broken the ta taboo. And then this leads to the discussion today. There was an article in, in Politico, I also heard, I didn't see it yet, that we discussed earlier in, in Brussels this week, last week, at the, this uh, mystification of the AI, a mystification of uh, algorithms, a mystification of data. It's so nice to use these widget and gadget and uh, applications, and you are using them as well, and that's why there is demand. But then, um, is it something that stopped developing AI? 
it actually benefits the very big tech mm. that you don't even try to have a grip what is happening. And in the end, it is the data that is collected with the sensors. Um, I'm in Geneva, my background education, but it's already a long time ago, maybe for the binary time, mm. with ones and zeros, and I had difficulties now with the quantum calculating and, and explaining you that. But it's still, it's the sensors. And then the sensors collected from the data. Uh, they form the data, and then the amount that you can cal calculate that data, and how that data is used, who can have access on that one, and, and all that. So there is in uh, um, platform regulation, there is now exceptions for the research. So be ready to work with the researchers. There should be exemptions for the research, so then at least we get a little bit crap of what is happening. And on the AI, we maybe can talk more on, on this one, but it was mostly the renew uh, commissioners in charge, Breton and Vestager. Uh, and then there's good ad ad addings uh, from active work that we did. I may say that we did, because al already the data strategy was active, accepted with the big majority. That it says, stated already then, when you take new technological innovations to the working place, the trade unions should be consulted. And I'm proud of that. It took six rounds to add trade unions and not the workers <laughs> to be consulted. So uh, I don't have fears that the next mandate we can regulate the big tech. We will not regulate big tech, we will regulate the usage of data and who have access. And there will be many other files would need it. Thank you. Thank you, Mia Petra. Yeah. And I think in the discussion we will also use your knowledge of the what's happening in the in the European Parliament at the moment. Um, I go to the next panelist, Linda Larsson from Allo Sweden. Uh, you're a researcher on these topics, so please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, yes, I have, and I have been following all these acts for as long as they've been on the table and before that, obviously. <laughs> yes. So, I mean, and obviously standing next to you, I mean, and I know that there is a very big push politically, not least from the progressive side to, to you know, be front runners and, and not run behind. There's always this ongoing discussion now about, you know, regulating. And um, I mean, I'm, uh, we have to congratulate you. I mean, this last past term, really, I mean, you have had some huge uh, regulating acts on the table and still is uh, negotiating. Uh, and I mean, from, from a, I don't know, but from a world perspective, uh, EU has really started to regulate a lot of these issues. And I, I think that we shouldn't forget that when we talk about all the, the difficulties and, and the challenges, that there is a lot of acts now uh, just uh, going in to be implemented uh, and also things still uh, on the negotiation table, uh, which makes it also a bit unclear exactly what's going to happen uh, for, you know, uh, after Christmas or early next year. Uh, but, and with that being said, uh, and as we know, uh, the Commission has on uh, numerous times now signalized that they also want to uh, sort of work on a directive that would extend sort of the same rights that we have in the platform directive also to the rest of the labor market. Uh, I, this is not a secret, so... Or if it is, it's out there now. But I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, these are ongoing. We discussions. want to make news as well, right? so we will bring no, it as news. No, but I mean, th th this is uh, then in fact old news. Um, so, um, so with that being said, I feel like there is a lot happening, uh, and we also now, uh, also from our perspective, need to. I wouldn't say take a step back, but we need to, uh, you know, work in two speeds. We need to think about the future, but we also need to do proper assessments and implementation when it comes to all these new acts, um, especially uh, what comes through the AI Act and the platform directive, not, not least. Um, and I say this from the trade union perspective because as colleagues earlier on pointed out rightfully, uh, you have now a network of regulation. Uh, that is intertwined. Um, and you have the issue of more and more individual rights, as we talked about before, uh, being produced. Uh, and we still 
have our collective rights that we as trade unions want to use. Uh, it's part of our power. It's part of our existence. So how do we balance this? How do we make sure that there's not a shift in power from the collective over to the individual? Because this is what we see in the platform economy. This is what we see in, in the economy as a, as a whole. A shift of power from the collective to the individual who has to carry their own burdens. And uh, the whole idea behind trade unions in the first place is to create power power for, for many. So we need to think thoroughly about uh, going forward with these acts. How could they benefit us? Uh, but how can we also make room for the systems that we have and also the national, especially as you heard today in the, in the Swedish context and also in the Nordic context where you have uh, rules uh, protecting uh, things already in place. So uh, with that being said, I just want to conclude with saying that I think now, I mean, European approach to digitalization has been one of human uh, in the center or human in control, uh, maybe not going as far as human in, uh, in command, but who knows. Um, but the question, there is a huge lack of the human, uh, the, the human in control approach. I mean, it, it's a nice pamphlet, but we don't really see it in action. Uh, and I just want to take the AI Act very quickly as an example. Um, obviously, there's a huge push now to, to try and make sure that this regulation is not going to be so burdensome uh, on the companies, obviously, and especially the small and tiny ones who are very fast and very innovative and, and all of these things. Um, and we have to be very, very, make very sure because already in the original proposal by the commission, uh, I mean, you have this division. Some of you might not know the AI Act as well as I do. I mean, it's also not a fault. It might be a s symptom of something else if you know this act already. Uh, but you have users, uh, or deployers that the uh, that you uh, and, and and the parliament has put forward and and you also have providers and the providers a lot of the focus is on the providers and and the obligations of the providers uh, but the users or the deployers there has not been so much um, regulatory or how do you say um, they're they're usually stating that they're not the ones producing the system, they're just using them, they can't be responsible. This has been the common uh, um, comment from their side and you can't put this pressure on us, but going back to the systems and how we want to have yeah, uh, human in center and also the trade unions and the workers, representatives being on board when implementing new tech. Of course, this is crucial mm -hmm. that the, call it users or deployers have uh, an active part in, in owning, and I am especially talking about when you, when you have impact assessments, for example. So it's so important that the companies, the employers, because the, this is the employers we're talking about, they need uh, to be uh, inserted into the legal text, they can't, you know, be left out. And especially, no, not when, you know, the, uh, the rounds are going on, the bargaining rounds, and things are coming in and things are going out. It's super important to, to make sure that they have the responsibility, because this is also uh, the point <laughs> where the trade unions come in. Um, and oh, so, so and, and, if, and if the employers don't, know anything or don't feel responsible, then where is the point of access for the trade unions and the workers? So I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there. But there, there is lot, a lot still to be wished for when it comes to these regulations. I still have good hope that uh, we will see better texts in the end. So yeah, I'm, I'm putting my uh, hopes to uh, <laughs> to you. <laughs> Thank so, you. <laughs> I, I don't, me Petra, you're not part of the negotiation team, but Brando Benife of the S and D group is is the rapporteur. So I will also I will report back to him on the on what was said here. Um, and I think it's very much uh, uh, important what you said about like in the end, it's it's companies that so employers are buying products often like in the previous panel, often made not in Europe, maybe not at the European mindset or by tech sector that doesn't understand even workers rights slash trade union rights so 
they need to be made responsible in a part to 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 take that responsibility they cannot say it's a black box and and i just bought it uh, but i used it on my workers so thanks a lot i think there's food for discussion already but we have two more panelists that uh, that also we have time eh? so we have a little bit because the commissioner spoke a bit short so now we have a bit more time for us <laughs> so um we have anna milana she came all the way from paris to to join us from the oecd you're an economist there in the future of work unit is that correct so uh, it's a it's a unit that focuses on the future of work and um You've been already very helpful. We had some context also, like you're doing a lot of research in the similar similar field as we are doing with this digital program. So there's maybe also some cooperation in the future together with uh, with the OECD. And you were bringing the more the, the non-European aspect as well. So I'm, I'm very curious to what's happening in the rest of the Western economies, because I think that's <laughs> the West. How, how do you say the OECD membership is the Western? Uh, how do you say you do it better than us? Uh, I'm not sure actually what the word is, uh, but no, thank you for for including me in this. Um, I'm I'm happy to be here, and to all of the FEPS researchers, I'm interested to talk to you because we're just starting a program of work on algorithmic management that I hope is very complementary to what you have underway through survey data and case studies. So I want to talk to to you in particular, um, and and also congratulations on on the scope of the work because it, we think it's exactly where it should be headed. We we lack data on how firms are using these tools and the impact on workers, and we need more. Um, so yes, being from the OECD, I thought I would provide um, uh, a perspective outside of the Nordics and outside of Europe. Um, I realize, though, that I'm quite on shaky ground bringing a regulatory example from the United States. <laughs> as, as an American national, I'm well aware that, that that's not the utopia. Um, <laughs> Which, which is an understatement. Um, but that being said, um, I hope you'll bear with me because I think there is at least one good example of a regulatory approach that's that's being taken, and it it comes. Um, on top of this topic of how algorithmic tools and their use by employers is totally opaque, it's totally a black box. And in order to understand how these tools are shaping work conditions, and indeed whether they're compliant with existing law that's on the books, we need more information about how they're working. And so this California law addresses exactly that. It's called Assembly Bill 701. And it applies to the use of quotas in warehouse distribution centers. So this is specific to um, warehousing, um, which, which is a critique that I'll come back to. Um, it's been effective for uh, just over a year. And to be clear what we're talking about, it's called the Amazon bill because this came about through investigative reports about how Amazon warehouse workers were prioritizing their compliance with quotas over their, their own health and safety. So for example, by not taking bathroom breaks, which, which was mentioned earlier. Um, and so this law is, is extremely simple, which is one of its virtues. It's basically providing transparency. This law mandates that the employer must give each employee on day one of the job access to information about how their performance is being tracked, rated, and the quotas that they're expected to perform according to. They're also entitled to information about any adverse disciplinary action that can be taken if they don't meet those quotas. So is their pay docked? Are their hours docked? Are there negative performance reviews? Is there termination? Access to all of this information on day one of the job, but as a matter of continual information upon request. And I think that this is, this is key because it gives workers the basic information that they need to understand their working conditions. Right? It's a question of transparency and then marrying that transparency with whether it's permitted um, by law. And so for example, a worker can use this information to work out if they take both a lunch break and two bathroom breaks in the course of their eight hour shift, they can't possibly pack 200 boxes. Right? And if a quota is unlawful, they can take that complaint to uh, the, the Labor Law Violation Committee. 
And so I think another thing that's important to recognize is this information is furnished to individual workers. In practice, individual workers are not going to take power against a company like Amazon. So I think its real importance is providing such information to worker groups so that worker groups can interrogate uh, these, these, these kinds of ways that the algorithms are shaking, shaping working conditions. That's a whole separate issue in the United States and lack of worker representation, but something that, that could be more viable here. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it addresses this fact that too often algorithmic management tools are opaque. I'm using the example of quotas here because that's the legislation, but I think the point stands um, quite broadly. Um, and when, when we look at new legislation that might take place on algorithmic management, I think the key thing to take away is it should establish extensive transparency rights. Uh, rights of access for workers to general information, um, including how their performance is managed and, and rated according to these, to these algorithms. Um, so that's an example from, from California. I have tried to have conversations about the response to this legislation. I mean, this is what we want to know, right? And it's very difficult to get this because Amazon isn't going to open its doors and say, thank you, we have adapted our, our algorithm in this way. Um, but I was able to have a conversation with, with one person, and it, it was an anecdotal report about how they took this legislation and used it to build in a buffer of time to the performance quota because they want to ensure that they're compliant, right? And this comes back to this, this idea of the human in the loop or human in command. I mean, at the top, someone is controlling the setting of these quotas and whether there is a sufficient buffer of time for a bathroom break. Consider that a bathroom break in an eight-hour shift. That's what we're talking about. And so I, I, I think I hear that there is change uh, at, at Amazon. I can believe it. But I think it's also really interesting because it dovetails with this idea that, that, that I read about. Apparently, in manufacturing firms in the United States in the mid-20th century, it was very common to build stress allocations into productivity quotas for exactly this reason. Bathroom breaks, breakage of machinery, stress, uh, just a basic human dignity kind of repose. And so it's, it's certainly capable. When we have this conversation about the benefits and, and the risks of, of algorithmic management tools, it's well within companies' capability to do at least that. Um, you know, when we talk about professionals such as ourselves, we talk about AI and automation and the potential for the four-day work week. We should extend that to entitlement to lunch breaks. <laughs> I know that's not the conversation in, in the Nordics, but it very much is in the United States. So um, that, that was my, my intervention from, from outside of the, the, the Nordics and, and Europe. And I just wanted to make one separate point because tax has, has been bubbling up in a lot of these conversations. Um, and I think part of this is, is the, the tax treatment of non-standard workers. I like to think of myself as, as well as a tax economist, but then in this idea of, of Asimoglu and so-so automation, we should also introduce into the mix taxation of so-so technologies, taxation of capital, because we're talking all about the expense to labor, but we're not really talking about that piece of the puzzle, and I think it deserves at least some mention, even though it's tangential. And that links into a whole field of work of the OECD on uh, corporate taxation and the yeah. taxation, mm -hmm. like how the, how do we share the, the tax burden on, uh, on labor and, uh, and capital for another time? But there is a link indeed. There's also a link with growing inequality and big tech and billionaires. Like there is something more uh, from a progressive standpoint that needs to be done than just, uh, just AI in the workplace. Um, we'll go to the last panelist before we open up the discussion. Um, <clears throat> Johanna Winkenbach, uh, you're the director of the Hugo Sinsheimer Institute for Labor. Uh, it's part of the Hans Blockler Institute. Yes. So, foundation. Uh, foundation. Oh, sorry, yeah. sorry. So, um, yeah, to, for you to, to, uh, 
to give your ideas. Yeah, thank you. Being the very last person speaking not only on this panel, but at the end of the day, I was already after the first panel like, okay, so what is there left to say? Because many important things that I had on my list uh, were set. Mm. And I'm not gonna uh, repeat all of this, but connecting um, to what you, Teresa, opened this panel with, I can very much connect to your critique, but I can also um, connect to the compliments towards the regulation coming from mm. the EU because it is addressing a very important aspects of digitalization and work, which is uh, this tremendous power and imbalance of power of the tech companies. Mm. Um, and their use of data and algorithms. And in Germany, we can see very clearly that those companies making extreme use of, for example, algorithmic management um, are those companies being in court at the labor courts fighting about the use of existing labor laws, such as works council rights, saying, why should we have works councils uh, in platform work? They're driving bicycles in the city. There's not even a plant. I mean, we're beyond the, the, the stage of saying they're not even workers, so why should they have workers' representatives? Now it's about, like, there's no plant. I mean, they have an app on their phone. Uh, so um, this is um, coincidencing, and this is why I think the platform work directive is very important, too, because it's addressing a very precarious field in which many risks cumulate. Um, no lunch breaks, uh, no toilet uh, breaks, <laughs> paid. <laughs> <laughs> exactly this. Yeah. And we have many good examples of the problems um, that have been addressed here very clearly with the use of um, algorithmic management and AI in work. Mm. For example, transparency and very important rights of workers' representatives in this field um, concerning digital access rights. I mean, the Platform Work Directive is coming up with um, addressing the problem that there needs to be communication channels of works uh, representatives and workers who have no common workplace. And um, this um, is this. We have the same debate in Germany. They uh, they want to rule out digital access rights. And as my colleague Torben said, um, he just took his plane, I think. Mm. Um, it's not about the platform work only, um, because since Corona, and this is not going to go back, uh, we have mobile work. So we have white collar workers who are not coming back to their workplaces anymore. So unions need digital access in these areas too. So. Um, since years, um, being the think tank of the German labor unions, I'm all the time like, like, be aware of the strategic meaning of this platform work directive and looking at the money the employers and the companies spent on preventing this directive to be uh, mm. enforced and to be uh, fruitful for workers' rights kind of reflects uh, the importance of this directive. Um, we had uh, talks about um, trust uh, concerning AI, and I think this is a um, very important aspect, and I would like to connect this uh, aspect with democracy. Uh, I mean, um, Friedrich Ebert Foundation in Germany today released the data of uh, the positions uh, of people towards uh, right-wing nationalism and really like uh, feelings of, of, of hate towards minorities and the numbers are rising extremely. Yesterday at the dinner I learned that uh, in the uh, votes in Sweden in the schools, the right-wing party was the second strongest party among the young people. Mm. This is a development taking place in Europe. So um, I think it's not exaggerated to say democracy is in danger. And this is a danger for mm. union rights in general, like beyond uh, the AI aspect. But the AI aspect is relevant for how we live democracy, how ideas spread or do not spread. Mm. And, and this is the connection to the trust aspects. We have research uh, in my foundation on, and other foundations uh, did this too. If people feel that they're just being a ball played by algorithms of their employers, just like the, the situation Jenny describes, this is no experience of you being uh, a human being having um, democratic rights. 
And this experience you make 40 hours a week, you don't go home and be like, but democracy is fine and working yeah. with me. So the experience that people make at the workplace, and this is why the yeah. trust aspect is a bigger thing than, it, it's, it's bigger than workers' rights. It's about how people feel being part in a digitalized society in general. And that's why it's so important. And the problem is, and I don't know if this is, this was my Swedish colleague's reaction here with uh, this transparency, right? Also in the act you described for Amazon. Transparency is very important because you can't enforce labor law and your existing labor rights if you can't prove uh, th uh, certain things. This is why the shift of burden in the platform work directive is so important. Mm -hmm. And it's this imbalance of knowledge between workers and employers that keeps, that bans people from enforcing existing uh, labor rights. But transparency is just the first step. Mm -hmm. And um, after, like, you need transparency in order to enforce rights, and then people need those rights. And this is my general critique and my doubt with the AI Act that um, basically you can say um, it's not addressing at all the reality of power imbalance and social partnership in the working life reality. So this AI Act is important with this risk approach, but it can only be a first step and we need a directive taking many good examples and hopefully advancing them. But this is surely depending on the political constellation we will have. Um, to enforce democratic working labor union rights um, in these digitalized workplaces. And um, I very much hope that something like the opening clause that we have in the Data Protection Act will go into the AI Act to at least make sure that we don't have the scenery that the AI Act is seen as this is the rules and this is the limit and there's no social bargaining and no collective rights beyond that. That would really be a problem. Mm -hmm. um, that's like a really very conc concrete fear that I have. And then, I don't know, we can go on with this in the discussion, but we talked about um, transparency and um, it was very interesting for me to hear like the limits uh, with the data protection, like saying this is a privacy right, so like the collective enforcement missing. And the thing with the algorithmic management is employers buy these things from producers of those systems. And anything that the works council needs to know from the employer in order to check is the system all right, is the data discriminative, Many times the employers say, we don't know, we bought it mm. from the provider. Mm. And then in the platform work directive, you see that the limit of transparency rights should be business secrets. And in the German practice, we already know that the works councils get the answer from their employer saying, sorry, I can't tell yeah. you more because this is, uh, this is the provider's business secret. Um, so there's many crit like very concrete yeah. critical points that really have to be, and I already see um, where employers are going to the weak spots of the um, of all those legislations and find their loopholes, and it's going to be fighting as always in the like daily life of unions with these laws that are about to come, but they need to come because they will be helpful. Mm -hmm. So I hear also like some details as well. Please, please give them also to us because we are like Mia Petra as well. Like she's in Brussels too. If you want to react even I like... Can, a I can immediately say that we, we thought uh, an S&D group, I was uh, doing the, the shadowing on the one committee and the main committee is uh, the Tudor Ace from the Libe and then a good colleague, he, he was the chair for the AIDA, AIDA committee, which is the special committee that we had. I was the vice chair, so a good cooperation with him. And his previous job, before working for the prime minister in Romania, he was in the DG just in the commission, mm. looking at the data justice. Mm. So he's a good person, in a, in a sense, together with the Brando Benefe from our Italian S&D member. So in the Article 2 already, in the parliament position, and it was parliament strong support, we have the safeguard ensuring that member states and commission can come up with the more ambitious and productive uh, uh, ver for workers than this AI Act is doing. So then uh, this is not, this is kind of a, 
bottom, <laughs> not, not the roof, and that is very important for us as self. And then also when it's a user or deployers, it's, it's also uh, very important that even if you use the uh, LLM languages or whatever, it's <coughs> at the moment in the negotiations that the scope is uh, from OECD, but then a bit broader than the Commission proposal, but then also so that it's not only SME saying that I'm using something from the Google and Google is not uh, responsible at all. Mm. <coughs> so trying to have all that. And when I mentioned the AI agency to help and then uh, having this start, there's also na national supervisory work that is very important, where also <coughs> trade unions have to you act. I have coffee here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Samuel, you wanted to come in for I think. Yes, I mean, I was going to pick up on a point that, that Teresa made and also Anna regarding <coughs> regulatory, regulatory tech. I think, uh, because as, as I said, what we see is that, of course, you try to build in all the rules into the system, right? Uh, but I think uh, something that we should watch out for is when we start adapting the rules to fit <coughs> the digital systems. Uh, the fact that certain kinds of rules will be easier to include in these kind of systems. The, with the systems which are supposed to ensure <coughs> compliance, ensure compliance with occupational safety and health, which could be a big, big good thing. But we also know that occupational safety and health is not just about the minutes, uh, uh, you know, the, how if your break is 15 or 20 minutes long, it's also about a lot of other sort of softer factors that we really try to pick up in, in, in occupational safety and health legislation. And what I'm afraid of is that uh, we will see a push for when, when we're discussing new uh, um, legislation in this field or, or revision of legislation, that would be a push for things that fit into the systems. Uh, one area where I think, which we haven't discussed, but I think that the labor movement should be very, uh, and sort of progressive forces should be very aware of, is social insurance. As some of the Swedish participants know, I, I led this commission on, 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 uh, for the government on parts of the social insurance system. And of course there, there's a lot of money to be saved uh, on the social insurance administration if you can have rules that can be handled automatically, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, and this will favor certain kind of rules, certain kind of requirements, and it will sort of disfavor, I think, some of these more humane kind of, where you have to make a different kind of, of course, someone say, well, you know, a really good AI model will, you know, manage to balance all these uh, factors in, but I think that we were very, very far from there. So I think we must also start thinking about how does uh, uh, sort of regulatory tech affect regulation, not just how regulation affects technology. And I think, and then I want to come in from the Dutch perspective, I'm from the Netherlands, and there we have already three cases, three major scandals of uh, AI tools or algorithms being used in enforcement of student loans, uh, benefits for parents with uh, childcare. Mm. And there was another one, I forgot, oh yeah, it's the visas. So the, the, mm. the whether or not you are a refugee or you're getting a visa, mm. it's all automated to save costs. And it's all like from, not even from an evil thought, but just like efficiency thought in the, in the public sector. But know. then, uh, th yeah, <laughs> <laughs> the thing is that the discriminatory effects, because there it always boils down to a discriminatory, discriminatory outcome uh, and the, the huge impact on people and there's no human in control there was no human che uh, check and also not control in the organization because usually it's on the tech level that somebody implemented it and <coughs> even like the leadership doesn't have have the control i would like to yeah teresa so you you are free to react because i also had a question and then maybe think already in the room like who has a question but uh, maybe you start quite provocative about like okay we're just making new rules mm -hmm enhancing this whole like regulatory tech and this whole like industry of compliance but now uh, ai uh, liability directive or indeed like the negotiation platform work and and the ai act and maybe also a new proposal of the of the commission on ai in the workplace what is the positive because the critique is clear but what should we do maybe you don't have an answer but what is the 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 the, the train of thought where do we need to search for answers in your opinion Okay, I don't know if I have an answer to that. I will think while I answer you because this is precisely my point. Also, I write a lot about it because what you see is, you know, the first move is that you basically commodify regulatory compliance, right? So you have a product for that. And now we will have uh, products auditing these products <laughs> by the same providers. So that's obvious. But, you know, my point is that the, the power to translate these laws and regulations, which have very good intentions, are left to precisely software designers and whatever lawyers and the limits of the tech. But you also see the platformization of compliance and the kind of 
move towards compliance as a form of corporate governance. Mm -hmm. So what I see, you know, is that uh, compliance is a managerial function, more or less now. Mm -hmm. And so you basically, uh, compliance is not only regulatory compliance, but, uh, but, you know, enforcement of compliance within and towards suppliers, others. Mm -hmm. And when it becomes a governance function, this is precisely the tech we have to negotiate on, <laughs> right? Uh, that's obvious. Uh, but it also the platformization, platformization of these products. You know what you do? You have a product for lots of purposes. Anti-money laundering, countering terrorism financing, right? KYC, due diligence, all that. You have a new ethics, uh, corporate ethics code, you put it in there. You have a new uh, anti-harassment policy, you put it in there. You keep adding policies into the existing tech. And it also increasingly serves this kind of crime prevention and preemption. So it has a very kind of surveillance gaze towards, of course, downwards, not to upwards, <laughs> towards the workers. And, and they, they will be evaluated and measured and risk flagged, you know, like uh, for different, you know, you, you want to spot insider trading, you want to spot corruption. But the problem is you use the same technology to prevent, you know, corruption as you use to prevent microaggressions or bullying or harms, right? And now you will also use the same technology to, to, <laughs> to audit this tech, right? So wh where does it lead us as a society is the, is the question, you know, and I'm thinking uh, like what kind of a world is this eventually creating for, for us? And regarding, you know, the, the, we often get lost in these technical discussions because of this, right? We, we want to audit these algorithms, but if you work uh, with workers and trade union representatives in workplaces, how are they supposed to even understand? Uh, and is the transparency or like disclosure the solution? Because you're not told what is important. You're flooded with data. You're flooded with reports. You're flooded with data points. Look at corporate disclosures. So you're looking at it and you're thinking like, okay, there is a, a list of suppliers of 2,000 suppliers all over the world. You find uh, locations in China, uh, you know, that are connected to forced labor. You find locations in Italy where you know there is uh, like abuse of work places, workforce and so forth. Uh but then you find the risk assessment on two pages of the company and you find, uh, well, the risk of forced labor is maybe like two and we have a c code of conduct that all suppliers have to sign, so everything is fine. I'm thinking, you know, when you're, who is doing these risk assessments? It's often the leadership. So if we are to approach this risk-based regulation, then let's say the, uh, the trade unions will negotiate on the risks and, and, you know, assessing those risks. And, you know, if you listen to the management, they will often tell you the risk is quite low and we have some kind of mitigation. But when you ask the workers, they say the risk is huge. And maybe it's even unacceptable to us because lots of this goes against your rights to privacy, against your, you know, basic dignity. Uh, and maybe we should have a veto right if you know our members at the company vote that this risk is unacceptable then we just don't impl impl implement this type of technology mm -hmm. uh, so there has to be some power given on the very risk assessment then because i feel this the definition of risk and the definition of the strategies to mitigate is always left to the employer so i think you know that's where the collective you know and and that's an easy call to make you know explain me the risk okay we assess it uh, I don't know, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and that that's interesting because that feeds in, in the co-determination and, uh, and yeah. the negotiation on the terms and perhaps that's some, some hook as well. Like it's not done the thinking, but we can, we can definitely investigate. Joanna, you wanted to react? Yeah, because um, actually one point I had on my list, I was reminded uh, by your question, like who's the human in the loop and who are those product designers who will then be in charge uh, and i mean this has two aspects because the ai act uh, kind of um, foresees uh, member states having institutions in order to take care of all these rules and at least for germany i can say i really don't see um, <coughs> neither uh, the people who are doing this uh, nor them um, being like integrated into the administrative system so there's really much work as you said much work to be done in the member state in order to make use of this but then i think we didn't talk enough about this discrimination aspect and when you ask like who is making those products we have to say it's white men making it and um, this is where i think we need more research as maybe a lack of knowledge but i think we're not really creative enough with thinking especially also from the labor union side this power aspect of data use and what could be alternative systems 
because we, we won't be able to design helpful and discrimination-free algorithms without good data sets. It's not going to happen, <laughs> so we need to talk about, we need to like think more of, and, and this is what I hear from unions uh, in countries with less uh, data protection rights, um, because they think about, okay, so let's, if all the data is connected, let's do it ourselves. Uh, so they kind of think of uh, data ownership of workers, and I think we're beyond this in our progressive thinking mm -hmm. on how to use data, and this is going to be very important. In the future, it needs to be financed, and we need people to think about it, and it should be diverse teams, really. I see that Teresa wants to react, but I, uh, in the lack of time, it, because I also want to have some questions from the room, if that's allowed. So we, I, I suggest also, because we, we are running out of time, to have all the three questions. I saw at least two or three uh, hands. Okay. So if we can combine them, and then we do a round of uh, reactions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Reijo Panan, and I work uh, for Nordic Iron, which is a, an organization for 21 uh, manufacturing unions in all five Nordic countries. This is merely a comment, but I ask especially Mia Petra to correct me if my judgment is totally wrong or even slightly wrong. Thank you for the first for the for the excellent presentations and and uh, panels. Uh, but to be honest, mostly amongst the mind uh, say, uh, like minded which is not a bad issue. But although I'm optimistic, there is the reality. We have heard both from the audience and from the speakers the need for collective rights, read trade unions' rights, in order to make, make the individual rights actually to function. Right. Uh, we heard Nicola Schmidt just a few 20 minutes, half of an hour ago, we heard Ursula von Leyen one week ago stressing quite strongly the need for workers' involvement and uh, influence and, and enhancing the possibilities. Mia Petra has been doing an excellent job, and here I come to the point until there comes the council, our governments. And here is the point where you can correct me freely. And uh, quite often, not only the AI, not only, only these, but the legislation that leaves from the Commission, perhaps in a little bit we a weak way, goes to the Parliament, most often gets better and falls into the wall on, on uh, our governments. And to be honest, in this room, not our Nordic governments are free from this vice for various reasons. But, and here is the optimistic point, um, we in the Nordic countries, with me, uh, we, we, I mean, of course, the trade unions, we have quite free access, access to the uh, ministers, to the parliamentarists. We have open, not perhaps open doors all the time, but uh, connections. And this is not the case in quite many European countries. So the optimistic point here is that we just need to keep on going. Thank you. So I think we keep uh, also the other questions and then we can, uh, uh, Mia Petra, it was aimed at you, I think you can react uh, in the round. So thanks for an excellently uh, fruitful discussion. Just one thing, you touched upon this, a couple of you, and perhaps some could some of you could expand on this. If you take sort of the concept of um, code as law, being that we talk about algorithmic systems, they're written in code, and then you could encode things in these systems to sort of help compliance and to sort of safeguard things. Do you find that a useful theoretical concept, or is that more of a practical Hail Mary, which actually wouldn't help us strategically? OK, 
Okay, so t two very different but very interesting points, and I think this is also relates to the previous discussion that we had. The more hopeful. There's one more question. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. Hi. Sorry. I, I, was know, I thought it was one question. Sorry, yeah. Frederick. Oh yeah, yeah. No, it's okay. Frederick Soderquist from the LO. Uh, okay. An often recurring discussion in these uh, topics at the EU level is the fact that Swedish unions like legislation to be flexible, meaning that the EU legislation sets a level and uh, if it suits our needs, we might be able to sell flexibility to the employers that they want. This might be a really good idea, especially giving Teresa's excellent talk on the fact that these standards can be hijacked. Uh, I'm wondering if you could react on that a little bit. Thank you. So I don't think that everybody can react on everything. Maybe we start with Mia Petra because one was really aimed at you and then the other two topics maybe we can make around, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So to get majorities, we have to have uh, not only social democrats, uh, left wing, or even greens, uh, we need someone else. And here we have also the liberals on board because this is not market and economy anymore. So they are not happy either. Maybe the conservatives are not happy because they are losing their ownerships on the uh, um, companies is losing. So th there was like this triangle and nobody's happy with the uh, value creation of the existing platform economy. And that's why Europe can react and, uh, and act also, I hope. <clears throat> Very good that you put the question that, because uh, that was from the previous parliament when I was still on, on coming here and then the suddenly good panel and then do we need anything else? Is the existing legislation enough? Is the occupational health and all that enough? Uh, and then also I combine it with the question that do we know? Do you have any idea or most of the people uh, working there, four-day workers on the very grassroots level, do they have the knowledge? I don't know. Are you informed if there is new negotiation box in the, in the factory that you can go inside and have a talk? That, that might be a luxus model that is analyzing your sweating, your speaking tone, your the, uh, whatever physical uh, control in, produced in Finland and you buy it to the Swedish uh, car factory. Is the legislation that you get it automatically? Or should there be like every time new technology is taken on board, uh, workers should be consulted and taken on board? So I like very much the uh, mining issue. So there is a lot of unlawful things happening when we don't know what is happening and there is not like obligation to tell the workers at the working place. So I think there. The need is really much like the working place level, but then also to tackle the big tech or big solutions, we need these frameworks that is uh, until so far I see that uh, AI uh, or digital age, we need to go through the things sector by sector kind of again. <laughs> it's like we ad adopted the new constitution in Finland 2020 yeah. and then took years and years to update the new uh, old laws to the new constitution. So I think this is uh, what we have to fight again for the toilet breaks, like uh, it was done uh, 100 years or 150 years ago. Uh, and then uh, mm. it, it's not here also. You're not paid if you don't drive. You're not paid for your stop or your, your uh, toilet break. So it's, it's here already. Yeah. So that's what I think uh, uh, when often people say we are late already with the AI Act and this is still the first in the world. <laughs> so yeah. I, I hope that it, it won't uh, create more um, loopholes or, or get hijacked, but then uh, at least it's tried. And then on this collective rights or so, it's very traditional politics then. That's why I said that it was like, okay, mention the workers, mention the individual rights, but then to have the trade unions mentioned took like six rounds and only that I had the hammer <laughs> there that I didn't pass it through without one. And it was not legislative, it made it a little bit easier. But but now when it's the legislative and still says that there should be <coughs> workers mentioned and then uh, a lot of uh, implementation is ne then needed. So this is only a start, I think. N this is not the end. And we need, mm. my guess is we need sectoral for many sectors, creative uh, work, uh, safety at work, mental health at work, and also look, looking at the very traditional fight that the EU trade unions have had, which is a priority legislation in the European level. Is it the free markets or workers' rights? And that's why also maybe we always use this digital single market like a word, so that prevails still that the, those rights of the internal market, market go over the workers' and human, even the human uh, rights. So back to the basics and politics. I don't know if anybody wants to, because we're a bit out of time. Teresa, you wanted to react already earlier. I don't know if you still still relevant. Maybe Anna wants to, if anybody else. Yeah. yeah. 
I can just answer the code of law. Uh, I mean, obviously, this is already happening with the RecTech that you have law encoded into these uh, tech solutions. Uh, obviously, the problem is that uh, very often it's EU level types of regulations, multi multinationals, you know, using these platforms, they look to global standards, to kind of best practices. That's what's being implemented into these RecTech solutions. So you often see that, you know, nobody would have an add in for like local Swedish codetermination, right? <laughs> so yeah, you could suggest that, but it will be just, you know, battle of tech. Uh, and I think what we need is politics, <laughs> in a way, on the in the in the workplace and uh, and so forth. Uh, yeah, I think uh, that's. I can. Yeah, can I answer yeah. Frederick's question yes. about? I think which I think in this situation with you know with, with all the Nordics here uh, is a very fundamental one. I mean, sort of what are the prospects of having EU regulation in the labor market that respects these sort of big institutional differences that we have? I mean, uh, now I go back to my roots. I'm a comparative labor lawyer from from the beginning, and that was what I'm supposed to to do. But I think. Uh, I think if we, we can look at there is EU legisla legislation uh, that has really managed to respect the differences between the models. I think the, all the di directives that were negotiated between the social partners before they became directives, so the ones on a typical work, for example, they are of a higher quality uh, than the 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 uh, uh, directives that we have been proposed as that we have seen later, in the sense that they ex they they sort of uh, they are devised in a way that works in different institutions settings, right? When it comes to, if you look at the platform work directive, I think we can see that, that there the commission tried to some extent to insert language that was supposed to respect the different kind, the, the differences that exist between the member states. Uh, a concrete example was that there is language regarding, you know, they, they, they realized, okay, not all countries have labor inspectors, right? Uh, uh, right. But then came the parliament and, and reinserted some kind of uh, um, quantitative target for for uh, for uh, uh, labor inspections into into in, in their in their amendments, and I guess the council will take that or something like that. But I mean, I think so. I think I would say, and this would be my message to the Swedish uh, trade union movement and also to the Social Democratic Party. Now, when I'm right now, I'm sort of free to speak as I want. I'm not employed by anyone. I really think that 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 that, that, that uh, we should take a more positive stance on, 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 on uh, EU regulation in the, field, in, in the labor market field, but at the same time uh, work closely with the European trade union movement on uh, sort of devising these in a way that respect these differences. It's not impossible to have meaningful European uh, uh, labor market legislation uh, 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 that respects these big institutional differences. And I would say that the institutional differences are bigger in the labor market field than they are in almost all other fields, right? At the same time, uh, EU legislation uh, uh, has come to respect these differences less than it does, for example, in another uh, field that I work in, when we look at competition law. I think competition law, uh, public procurement, state aids, is better at accommodating uh, and realizing the, the differences, the institutional differences between member states than is uh, labor legislation. So I think I've, I'm, I'm optimistic uh, sort of about this possibility to make meaningful EU law. That can be accepted also by Nordic trade unions and, and Nordic governments. So the very, very last comments for Linda, because we heard the hello as well, yeah. Linda Larsson. <laughs> Thank you. And then yeah. we will go for the closing remarks. Yeah. I mean, very, very shortly on this, and obviously it's a, it could always be the elephant in the room, you know, but obviously for us, uh, um, you know, respecting, you know, e the EU competence and, and what uh, the competence that EU has is, of course, important to us. And when, you know, and then the, we have the discussion of, you know, when EU expands, um, extends their rights sort of to regulate areas where we feel there might not be uh, room or, or competence enough to regulate. But I mean, obviously, that is the, uh, uh, the, the, the big elephant in the room. But going back, and I don't want that discussion to spill onto what we're talking about here, because we have seen, obviously, everyone could just Google, you know, if you take... Um, early on uh, documents or regulations uh, and compare them uh, did uh, done 15 years ago and compare them to the uh, platform directive you know the level of detail is enormous in comparison so there has been a shift in the will to regulate uh, also uh, you know 
it impacts the room that you know that you have on national level and and with that being said um, we are not opposed to EU regulation the fact is just that when you do that since we do have our way of negotiating especially on the social uh, and in the labor market we need the room and the maneuver to be able to negotiate uh, it also means it might be a strange system, but our bargaining power is based on the fact that we are able to sometimes deviate. We're able to trade things with the employer in order to gain something else. And so that room for maneuver is crucial to us. And up until now, we were always given this room. Uh, now there has been discussions about you know, how good is this room for maneuver? And for us, it's crucial. So I think we, we need to also separate, you know, the, the Nordic skepticism that I know is out there. Yeah. And um, maybe in the, then we, we give a round of applause, I think. Maybe that's also part of the solution where we have to find, because it was mentioned before as well, this room of maneuver, this room that's created with more transparencies, maybe also where you negotiate. Mm. So your worry might be translated in an approach that's useful for everybody. But that's just my thinking if I hear you speak after listening all day to, uh, to the nice discussions. I want to thank you all for, for being here. Uh, thank you for the nice... Uh, so. Uh, yeah, an applause and then uh, over to Maria. And the discussion continues. <laughs> okay. Thank you all uh, for that. We have already reached the end of this conference, almost, but we have two closing remarks. And firstly, I'd like to welcome Christina Birke Daniels. You're the director of the Nordic office of Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. And finally, uh, Maria Malchnig, director of the Karl Renner Institute and vice president of FEPS. So Christina, you go ahead, and then Maria. Thank you so much. Ah. Dear guests, what a great and inspiring conference we've had. Um, I am directing Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. We are a German political foundation, but it's also an honor to be called one of the Nordic think tanks, I must say. Um, and I think it has been inspiring for me because it has outlined our crucial tasks for the future. We must collaborate to ensure a responsible use of AI at the workplace. We must lobby for uh, suitable political regulatory frameworks the difficult this might be. Um, we must promote transparency about the objectives and operating modes of AI and work with trade unions to ensure the participation and qualification of workers in order to have co-determination. That's uh, quite an agenda. But it's also a very clear one. It guides us towards a better future, I'm convinced. Bear with me because I have a long list of people to thank <laughs> before I outline you some uh, steps ahead. First and foremost, I would like to really, really say uh, thank you to all of our participants, both here in Stockholm and online from lots of European countries. We are grateful you could join us today. And obviously, my thanks go out to all the speakers, panelists, moderators who have really been brilliant in sharing their knowledge and enlightening us with their expertise. This conference would not have been possible without the support and collaboration of our consortium partners. Don't worry, I won't mention all of them. Um, but really, this is a great group, a great collaboration, and uh, I think we produce many synergies. Your dedication is really what gives us new and progressive ideas. The progressive here is what's most important to us. And special thanks to the organizing team, FEPS, Gerard, and Luis, uh, Tiden, Johan, Maria, and also Tobias, 
And obviously, Maike on my team, thank you so much. That was hard work, but lots of attention to detail. Thanks to Linda Larsen and Ello for making us feel so welcome and cared for here. And then more special things, and maybe you could come and join us. Jan-Erik Storstadt, uh, still as Secretary General of SAMAC, yeah, invaluable contributions. This would not have happened without you, really. Um, on behalf of all the think tanks uh, in the Nordics, I uh, say Tusen Tag, Mange Tag, Tag Tag, and uh, Tag Samike. If, if think tanks are your friends, uh, you go home very, with uh, lots of uh, reading. Um, but don't Thank worry, you. we also sweeten it up a little bit. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, like I can retire now. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, and I'm sure we will see you on one of those panels uh, as an expert because you are so passionate about the subject that we do not want to lose your insights. Looking a little bit into the future, this is just one part of our digital program. Um, we have three research strands with different aspects, uh, touching on different aspects of AI. And uh, please expect in the coming months some publications of these research programs. We will first focus on data analysis of remuneration and platform work. Um, Christopher Klavind is doing that one by the Danish Economic Council of the Labour Movement. Movement. And then probably in spring next year, we will see two more policy papers, one on the outcomes of a worker survey on the experiences of algorithmic man management, and uh, the other one is on the outcomes of company case studies of algorithmic management. I'm sure you will, we will all be able to use these publications in our future work. We have planned more events in 2024, watch the space, and I'm really grateful that uh, we have FEPS to realize them together with. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Maria. I had the, ple the pleasure in uh, June to succeed Jan Erik as uh, FEPS uh, Vice President. And as such, uh, I'm really, really grateful um, to all of you and to everybody who made uh, the launch of this Nordic Digital Program, program happen. Um, many people were already thanked. Let me just uh, outline one more. Justin, who sits in the, in the very back here, um, who uh, has, has been working for FEBS before and started um, organizing uh, the program, program. Thank you very much as well. So um, delivering um, closing remarks is always uh, a tricky thing. And uh, I think especially today when we had this rich program full of experts uh, and I have to say I've learned so much and uh, uh, especially as an, as an Austrian it was fascinating to witness a little bit of the inner Nordic um, <laughs> debate about uh, trade union labor movement and EU regulation. Um, uh, this is also very interesting for us. But uh, let me just uh, st st uh, try to make this uh, final bracket by stepping um, back one step um, when I think uh, like the question of uh, how democratic societies can shape digitalization political is one of the um, most important questions we are facing today and there are several fundamental questions that stand behind the debate uh, and the debates we led today. One crucial question for humanity is uh, where, where is actually the human advantage in times of technology? And recently I stumbled over a quite remarkable book uh, with the title Framers. I don't know if anybody of you has read it uh, by three authors, Kenneth Kukie, Victor Meyer Schönberger and Francis de Vericourt, um, who asked themselves the question, what actually is the human advantage in um, times of technological um, progress. And they, in the very beginning of the book, they tell the story of Regina Barsillet. She uh, is a professor at MIT and she got famous, famous when in 2020, with the help of artificial intelligence, 
she discovered the first new antibiotic compound for 30 years, which kills over 35 powerful bacteria. And amongst those 35 powerful bacteria are the World Health Organization's top three most deadly bacteria. And as all of you know, that uh, bacterial antibiotic resistance is currently one of, the, uh, one of humanity's biggest threats. This is quite a thing. So the news was um, all over the place, all over the world. The Financial Times had a front page headline, and I quote, AI discovers antibiotics to treat, to treat drug-resistant diseases. So the authors of Framers argue that this headline actually really missed the real story. And the real story was that Professor Basilei and her team, out of her and their own thinking, developed a totally new approach of solving the problem of resistant bacteria. Instead of searching for molecules which are structurally um, similar to existing antibiotics. And this was uh, uh, how the research had been usually um, proceeded before. She and her team actually programmed and trained an algorithm to eventually screen more than 100 million molecules over a couple of days to find if actually any of these molecules kills bacteria. So she and her team, they defined the problem, they designed the approach, they choose the molecules to train the algorithm and finally selected the database. And once the AI was successful in discovering the winning molecule, the research team analyzed it and decided how to proceed, etc., etc. So, of course, not everybody is an MIT professor. And I think we had uh, plenty of examples also today that there are very different um, paces of digitalization in the, in, in, in the world of work. And of course, algorithms can and will and do already replace certain human tasks. But I think this example is quite eye-opening um, when it comes to what kind of human tasks machines never will be able to do. A second uh, crucial question is, what, what is actually the goal of digitalization and te technological improvement? Is, does, is the goal always maximal feasibility? Is it aiming at everything that's possible or is it rather social utility and progress? And I think from a progressive point of view, technological progress does not end in itself. It should improve people's lives and societies. So digitalization has a huge impact on our society. And at today's conference, we heard from many perspectives to which extent digitalization particularly shapes the workplace and what this means for social democratic politics. Um, I'd, let me try to underline just a few core conclu conclusions from uh, today's discussion. So first, it cannot be that employers single-handedly determine the frameworks and directions of digital innovations and also demand the full profits out of the productivity gains for themselves. So there has to be a fair share for everybody in it. There are most obviously different scenarios regarding the technological development at the workplace. One scenario would be maximizing automatization with as little human intervention as possible. The other one would rather provide assistance and tools for humans so they can fully develop and use their very human skills. And uh, very often today, um, it was said we need humans in command, even if we have to choose which, <laughs> which humans should be, should be in command. So we have plenty of other fields. I mean, we have job search and um, the work of employment agencies that are based to a large account on digital tools, even on algor algorithms. These algorithms, that are created to target potential top performers and set aside unemployed people with whatever weaknesses are used. And they can be and are highly problematic and increase inequalities. We need knowledge. This was also a very important uh, 
uh, argument today. Knowledge and training, both for workers, but also for policymakers, for workers' councils, for trade unionists, and everybody else who is included in the and involved in the debate. And in the end, uh, and we've heard this today as well several times, like in any other social issue, if we succeed or not is a matter of political power. And it is also a matter of how healthy and stable our democracies are. And without healthy and stable democracies, everything is nothing. And we are in Sweden right now, where we see um, uh, how the political development is, but Sweden is not the only country. We have the surge of the far right all over um, the European Union. And as an Austrian, trust me, I know what, what, I'm, what I'm talking about, unfortunately. Yeah, and, and I think this will actually be, uh, will be our, our most important struggle also over the next year, because we're also, um, uh, we're also uh, having European Parliament elections. Um, next year. So this will be very important because um, there won't be any digital humanism when there are conservatives and far rights in power everywhere. So thank you once more. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for everybody to uh, participate. Um, do I re do I have the last word? No, you, you will already. <laughs> you will still. You will see, still announce that there will be a reception. So thank you very much. And yeah, and uh, good luck to the program. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, I have to take the opportunity to have the final word. <laughs> uh, I just want to say thank you uh, to everybody. I'm not going to repeat uh, what everybody else has, has said, but I again want to thank Ello uh, for, for hosting us. I want to thank Linda especially, who was here extremely early this morning to get everything ready. Uh, so thank you and thank you all for, for coming. There are drinks served uh, outside and some some um, some niblets, <laughs> some niblets. So uh, thank you and keep enjoying yourselves and uh, never stop fighting. Thank you. Thank you.